Okay. Tonight I want to talk about um, inner prayer based on the writings of, of St. Dmitri Rostov, who was um, born in 1651 and reposed in 1709. 1651 is a very important date in, in English history, actually. It's the um, abolition of the monarchy and the, uh, the reign of terror by Oliver Cromwell um, for a number of years. Um, it's also um, a time of a terrible flood in Europe, which most people don't know about, including myself. Um, the North Sea flooded, took out islands off, off the coast of Germany that just disappeared and drowned um, thousands of people. And this happened twice, once in February and once in July, and Amsterdam was flooded, because well, Holland being below sea level. And so this was like a tsunami, I suppose, equivalent um, in 1651. I discovered that when I was looking at, trying to find out who's well, contemporaries of uh, St. Dimitri, to put it into history. Uh, contemporaries of St. Dimitri is Bach, Alexander Scarlatti, um, many scientists, Newton, people like that. So that, that's the sort of time that St. Dimitri um, was um, with us. He's talking about inner prayer. It, um, our Lord says, God says that in, in the Gospels of Matthew that when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray in secret. It says in Salome, um Clit. No, clit is? Yeah. It just means a little room. It doesn't mean a closet in the modern sense of a wardrobe. Um, and this, what St. Dimitri says, that this means that we should enter into the closet of our heart. And this is very important. Um, and I have a story here, which I think will give us a, an introduction to it. There was a monk called John who lived in Alexandria and uh, he went to Sketus into the desert and he met Abba Philemon. And he said to Abba Philemon, what must I do to be saved? Um, I can't concentrate. My thoughts are scattered. They go, they wander where I don't want them to go, into sin, in other words. What can I do about it? And Abba Philemon was quiet for a few minutes and then he said, you have the sickness that people suffer from who are external. The spiritual sickness caused by being having an active external life and not an interior life. He says, he says have you, you obviously have never f felt the warmth of love and knowledge of God. Because when you pray inside, in your heart, in your room, in your closet, meaning your heart, then there is warmth. You begin to feel the warmth of prayer. But in your case, you're just reading prayers. You're going to the church, you're a monk, you're doing everything you're meant to be doing that's right in an external sense. But you have to have an interior life. Otherwise, this has no meaning, it's empty. He says, now what I want you to do is go back and, and go to your cell and start to practice secret prayer, meaning the Jesus prayer. So go back to your cell and practice that, and then you will see the difference that will come to you. And he said, you must keep silence. And that means that not necessarily not talking to people, it means the silence of your mind. Yeah, that's the hardest task, is not be thinking about everything that you can consider. But to have a time when you don't think about anything, you just say the prayer. This is very important because this will, own without, without this method, without this technique, you'll never have any peace. Your prayer will always be distracted. So he says, and you say this prayer, go to your cell and practice the prayer. Okay, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that um, when you wake up in the morning, you wake up and say the prayer. When you go to sleep in the evening, you, go, you say the prayer before you go to sleep. If you're eating, you're saying the prayer. If you're working, you're still saying the prayer. And even if you're talking to people, you're still saying the prayer, because you can have the prayer inside 
you can be conscious. So this is, um, St. Dimitri says, it's remembrance of God. And the only way we can remember God 24-7 is through saying the Jesus Prayer. And this is very important to practice it. In England, um, at the monastery of St. John the Baptist um, in Essex, the rule of the, the monastery was the Jesus Prayer. So on the weekends there would be the normal vigil, Vespers, there would be the, uh, the liturgy on Sunday, and on feast days, all feast days. But otherwise, the whole cycle of prayer, communal prayer, together was Jesus Prayer. So on a Monday morning, for example, at six o'clock, the prayer, we would assemble in the chapel, I was there, it would be six, uh, some six o'clock, and each person in the, in the, whoever was in the chapel would be assigned to the prayer to say aloud. And sometimes it was said in Greek, sometimes in French, English, Slavonic. I can't remember any other language that was used, but that was common to most people that understood. Everybody knew the prayer in those four languages, because it's very, very simple. And so they'd start the prayer, and... When you had, when you said, when you felt that you couldn't say any more, then you would stop and you say, you know, Slava Tsui Sin or Glory be to the Father, and somebody would say both now and ever and start the prayer again. And this will go on from six o'clock till eight o'clock. And then they would stop, have breakfast, and the day would begin, and whatever one was doing. It was very difficult um, on a physical level to stay awake. Because if you get out of bed in the morning and you start to concentrate, um, you begin to yawn and feel very sleepy. And so this was sort of difficult to, over to overcome. But after a while, um, it became easier. I remember we used to joke because Father Raphael, um, I think um, he kind of knows about it. He's, a, he's now um, Archimandrite in Romania. He's quite well known as a spiritual father. But in those days, he was a young deacon. And uh, he said that he, during the prayer, he would lean against the wall uh, because that would keep him awake. Because if he fell asleep, he would then slide down the wall and make a noise in his cassock, and that would wake him up. Now, this is just a joke, but I mean, it's, you know, what I'm saying is it was not easy to do this. Six till eight. And then in the evening, instead of Vespers, Although we'd start with the first psalm, we'd go straight into the Jesus Prayer from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So each session of this prayer is two hours. When we start learning the prayer to say it, we probably can last five minutes, if that, before we lose concentration. But the, the important thing is that it is, without this prayer, there is no inner spiritual life. Without this prayer, there is no real prayer life. Because what happens is that we get up in the morning, we say some prayers, and then we forget God until something reminds us maybe later around about lunchtime. And there's so many other things to do because you're studying, or working, all these things. And so this is why it's very important to have this prayer as a part of who you are. So you have to, it is mechanical, it has to be mechanical at the beginning. You just say the prayer and you find yourself drifting and you come back again. Um, five minutes, ten minutes, however much you can do. And it depends on the person. Um, but this prayer sets a foundation for spiritual life. And many people don't understand it. They think that they can't understand the value of it. But all the saints have recommended this because this is the only way that we can enter and be quiet before God. Because St. Dimitri says that when you enter the heart, you find heaven. So inside you, yes, each one of us individually, is heaven. The Holy Trinity is there. The Mother of God, the saints, the angels are inside. And so when we go into ourselves and start saying the prayer, then we are in the, the presence of God, and we're able by, we receive power um, from these prayers to carry out what we have to do during the day. And so we start the day with the Jesus prayer and we take it with us. We don't switch off to go to work, we take it with us to work. We take it with us to study whatever we're doing. 
And so it becomes a part of the whole day and not something which is separate, first thing in the morning, last thing at night, if we're still awake. And this is a habit which is very, very important. And it, it creates um, seek a secret communion with God. And so when we're at work and we have difficulties and problems and situations, we're saying the prayer inside, we begin to know how to deal with the world around us. St. Demetrius says, have you tasted spiritual sweetness? Well, you can't unless you've actually started practicing the prayer. If you practice the prayer, you will. And he says that um, there are two kinds of prayer that people practice. There's two kinds of prayer. The first is outward, the outer prayer. And then the other one is the inner prayer. The inner prayer is the Jesus prayer. The outer prayer is reading psalms, uh, being in church, reading um, you know, whatever we're in. Our prayer book, these sort of prayers. These prayers are good. Akathis, but these are outer prayers. And the, the important thing is that the inner prayer is more important. And when we practice the inner prayer, then the outer prayer has more meaning. Because you could read Psalms and, and not have any feeling or, or, or any sense of the presence of God. But if you practice the Jesus prayer, then when you go to read the Psalms, the, prayer, the Jesus prayer is there at the same time as you're reading the other prayers. This is why it's very important when we're in church, okay, to say the Jesus prayer. Because in the liturgy, or it doesn't matter what service, Vespers, liturgy, we begin to dream, think about things, and, and, and that's why the prayer will help to bring us back again. Very important if you're singing on the Kleros, to be saying the prayers you're singing. Your thoughts are working whether you're singing or not, and if you know things very well, you don't even know whether you sang something or not. Is that true? Admit it. Now put your hand up. Yeah, because it becomes automatic, and it's amazing how you can be singing and even Slavonic and not, you know, not really be there. But with the Jesus prayer, helps us to focus. So you can say the Jesus prayer and sing at the same time. And not, when I say say, I'm not saying out loud. I'm saying here inside in your heart. And so this is very important. We need the Jesus prayer as the foundation of our spiritual life as the foundation for our services. It's very important. And it's, it's um, important to make, make things a habit that when you do things, so like you start doing the dishes, the moment you start doing dishes, you say the Jesus Prayer, and it becomes associated with it. Uh, in church, if you're lighting the lamps, if you're responsible for lighting lamps in church, you can be saying, don't think of anything else but to say the prayer. If you're putting flowers into church, cutting flowers in the kitchen, getting all these rain, that becomes a part of your prayer life. That's prayer. And so you can say, Gospel is also Christ the Lord. So all the time we're saying it. And then it becomes a habit. Then it becomes the foundation. That's the vanya, foundation of our prayer life, the foundation of our worship. And it's very easy to live on an external level and only do the outside things. They're not bad in themselves, but they don't have meaning without interior prayer, which is the presence of God. So you have two kinds of prayer. There's the outer prayer, and one is like reading prayers, reading on the kleros, reading chesi, the, the hours, reading your communion prayers. Okay, that, that's outer prayer, that's outer prayer. The inner is thinking of God while you're saying it. Thinking of God while you're saying it, reading the prayers. Reading communion prayers, I think, is very difficult because there's too many words. Too many words in the sense that you can't remember what you said or concentrate. But if you have the Jesus prayer as a foundation, then the, the, the communion prayers begin to make sense. And I've always recommended to you not to read all the communion prayers as though that's what I have to do and therefore I can go to communion. Because it does, it's not that's missing the whole point. It's better to read one or two prayers with your heart than read lots of words. 
And I think it's very difficult to read the whole, all the prayers that are required with, with any feeling, without uh, losing what you're trying to say. This is, a, this is a struggle, this is a battle, this is a spiritual battle that we all have to deal with. Um, outer prayer is a love for wisdom, reading spiritual books, maybe, you know, lives of saints, going on pilgrimages, all this, this is outer prayer. And the inner prayer is actually love of God. And you see God in everything, like we go on a, on a, on a vacation, for example, we see some beautiful sunsets or sands or you know swim in the sea. Whatever you do, and in the physical sense, this is wonderful. But we we see the creation, but we don't necessarily see the Creator. When we have love for God, all these this, these vocations have vacation, sorry, have a different emphasis. It isn't just entertainment and relaxation. There is also it's a part of your prayer life. So it makes the vacation uh, something very special in which you love God. Keenness of intellect is an outward prayer. Keenness, uh, having a, a, bright, a brain that's, that's you know, intelligent, using intelligence, whatever it may be. Using the skills that God has given you. This is outer prayer. Notice that all these things are prayer. There's no such thing as work on its own. It's all prayer. But that's outer prayer. Inner prayer... Of, it is a warmth of spirit. Now, you can't create warmth of spirit because that can lead, that's not what it's about. We're not trying to go on a high or something. This is, the warmth of spirit comes from saying the prayer and it will come from God. When we start practicing the Jesus prayer and when it becomes the way of how we live and what we think, the way we think, then we realize that the body is only temporal. Now when I talk about body, I mean everything. I mean riches, bank accounts, if you have one, house, job, career, wife, husband, children. These are all passing. Not, I don't mean that they're not important. And what I'm saying is that they, uh, what we see them is on the body level and they are passing. I mean, how tragic it is to see, you see a beautiful young child and then you know that in 50 or 60 years later it's going to be a little old, shriveled up person. And we see people and think, oh, isn't that shame, look at the state of them. You see their photographs of them when they were young and handsome and whatever, and now they're decrepit, old. Because that is temporary. That's not what life is about. I'm not saying don't care for your husband or your wife or your children or your work, I'm not saying that, what I'm saying is that these things pass. They don't pass, the people don't pass. Your husband, your wife, your children don't, don't disappear. They come with, hope, with, hopefully they're in the next life as well, but there'll be a different relationship. It says in heaven that they, they, they do not give in marriages in heaven, but that doesn't mean to say that people don't have any relationship with each other, especially if they've been married in this, in this earth. It's not going to be broken up, but it's not the same as it is, as it is at this time. Visible things belong to the body. That's beautiful things. Riches, glory, wife, children are all temporary and will pass away quickly as a shadow, says Dimitri. That doesn't mean to say that these things are beautiful in themselves or important, our families, but they are temporary. This relationship is temporary. This condition is temporary. So your relationship with your wife or with your husband is going to be different in the next life. I don't say you're not going to be married in the next life, I don't believe that. But it's not what we understand as marriage, put it that way. The te and I have a quote here from Saint um, Bishop Saint Ignati, Briancianino, Bishop Ignati, who, say, who says that the test of everything is prayer. The test of everything is prayer. Prayer is the source of everything. Prayer is the driving force of everything. Driving force of everything that you do and how you think is prayer. Prayer is the director of everything. If prayer is right, everything is right. So, are things wrong in your life? Are things going wrong? The answer is prayer. 
And he comes back to this monk John and saying, I'm, I'm distracted, my, I, my, my mind is scattered, I, I don't know what to do, I'm thinking about all sorts of things I shouldn't be thinking about. And, and Saint Philemon says to him, go into your room and pray. And so when we are faced by these difficulties in, in life, and many of us are, in many different ways, it is, the only answer to that is prayer. And if you feel a, a panic attack coming on, because some everything's you know collapsing around you, that's the time that you have to pray. And um, Saint Ignati says, prayer. Sorry, this uh, he says prayer reveals the hidden passions. When we start to say the Jesus prayer, we begin to see who we really are. We begin the sins become to come to the top. Remember, I talked about um, like when you make it starting a garden, you start digging, the weeds come up to the surface. Well, some do, have to find some, but you know what I mean. It, 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 things start to move. Once you start to pray, then you begin. Then your fallen nature, which we all have, wars against us. So we're not surprised that we're being tempted the moment we start to pray, but that's, it starts things off, as it were. It starts things in, in motion. So we, prayer reveals hidden passions and, ta and tames them. That's the important thing. So whatever your passion may be, when you start to pray about it, then the prayer will tame it. It doesn't say get rid of it. it. doesn't get rid of it. It tames it. It becomes controllable. Prayer shows our captivity to fallen spirits. Saint Ignati talks about the fallen, fallen angels. We are in captive to them. But when we, if we give in to our fallen nature through sin, um, the the fallen angels join in as well. So sometimes temptation comes from within us because of our passions, the way we behave, the way we have lived. Also, temptation comes from outside, which is the fallen angels. And prayer is able to work out who's, who's who is, you know, what's going on. It gives you discernment. You can see, you start to pray and then you realise, okay, that's, from, that's nothing to do with me, that's coming from outside, why is that happening? And this, then we begin to become wise and understand that we're under spiritual attack. Then we can understand temptation from whether it's fallen nature or alien spirits, but it can be overcome by the Jesus prayer, in a prayer. So when we're under, um, under terrific uh, stress, temptation, that's when we need to start to pray. And I think you can see the, the value of just concentrating on the prayer, then you're not actually confronting all the stuff that's hitting you. Because once you try and reason it out and say, oh, well, this is because of that, you lost. That's the end of it. You lost the battle. You just, you just head down and say the prayer. St. Ignatius says... Um, when we are assailed, oh yes, it's very important. When we are assailed, attacked by passions and devils, we should proclaim our faith in the Lord by devoting ourselves to, to prayer. In other words, this is an opportunity, what he calls martyrdom. So when everything gets, uh, attacks us all at once, from within ourselves, from outside, this is an opportunity for martyrdom. Not despair, but martyrdom, and it's a test of our faith in God. That means we really do it. Think of Job, the, the, the life of Job, the terrible things that happened to him, but he kept his faith. You know, he, the devil said, well, if you do something bad, you, 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 he's only good because you support him. Take away your, your support, and you'll see really what he's like. Well, he took away his support, and he saw what he really was like, and he was amazing. Faith in God. Yeah, and so when everything's you know everything's against us, in, uh, and we're, we're uh, very concerned about what should we do, how we do this, how we do that, the answer is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And to repeat that, and so on a practical level, we should have a prayer group, Chotki, Kompaskini. Have it in your pocket. You should carry it with you. It's your sword. It's a spiritual sword. Yeah. There was a nun in, in Bulgaria. This is in the life of Saint Seraphim of Sophia. Um, 
she was, had to go somewhere. And if you've ever travelled in Bulgaria, I mean, certainly in communist times, they, they were non-existent public transport, or very difficult. In the bus and going along, you suddenly realised, I left my prayer rope behind. I cannot go without my prayer rope. So she prayed to St. Seraphim, who was bishop. I mean, you know, the Ladika helped me. And she got off the bus, went back to her apartment, got her prayer rope, put it in her pocket, got away. I thought, now nah, what am I going to do? Because I don't get no more buses today. Lo and behold, what happens? Empty bus, terminal bus coming along, going to go to the uh, bus station, sees her and says, oh, do you want a lift? She gets in and gets a free ride and gets to where she wants to be with her prayer rope. She would not travel without her prayer rope. There's a, a, I saw a, 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 a photograph, actually, I think it's on YouTube. No, no, I don't know. No, Facebook or something. Um, with, with kids sitting there with their smartphones, or looking, you know, everybody looking down their phones. And opposite is a monk sitting there with his prayer rope. <laughs> so he's also, you know, texting. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.